This is the second reflection lecture. We're starting on um, the uh, seismic uh, overheads um, number one. And uh, so it's the seismic1.pdf file. We're starting on the 38th page of that, uh, of that set of overheads. And we've been talking about the basics of seismic reflection. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, normal move out, and that's the uh, the shape of the hyperbolic curve. Uh, so it's asymptotic to uh, a velocity, which we call an apparent velocity or um, an NMO velocity, since we uh, we use it in determining uh, the um, the the shape of the hyperbola. So uh, we get uh, of, from a pure profiling experiment. Um, we get the location uh, and uh, maybe the depth of structures that we see, of features that we see in the uh, in the profiling, but we can't get the depth uh, from the time because we record time unless we have velocity, and so we we do the pure sounding experiment to determine velocity, and there's a lot of factors in velocity, um, and uh, some of them are, uh, for instance, the dip of the reflector. Uh, if the reflector is uh, is dipping at all, then the uh, the apparent NMO velocity, the stacking velocity, the uh, asymptotic velocity, uh, will go up in proportion to the uh, uh, cosine of the dip. So uh, actually inverse proportion of the cosine. So that's uh, uh, one of the uh, factors we have to deal with. So of course, what we're looking at uh, in most reflection surveys is, is a lot more than just one reflector. We'd like to look at a whole stack of reflectors. And so first, I'll, I'll consider that we have a, a very simple, uh, geologically simple area. So here's a cross section here. It's in X and Z. And there are four reflectors here at uh, depths Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And each reflect reflector um, is at the bottom of a layer, and of course uh, uh, there's a thickness to that layer. So Z1 is equal to H1, that's the upper reflector, and then Z2 is equal to H1 plus H2, right, and so forth. And we've got H3 and H4, and then each reflector, uh, you know, which we number, has um, V1, uh, V2, V3, V4. Each each reflector has its own velocity. So and whether these, uh, you know, these velocities don't have to be different for us to find a, a reflection uh, and be able to record a reflection. Usually they are. The strongest reflections come from big changes in velocity, but it's also possible for us to get uh, strong reflec reflections where there aren't any changes in velocity. Now, just to um, uh, just to to illustrate what's going on, okay, um, we're going to consider that uh, we have. Uh, the uppermost velocity v1 being less than the next one v2, which is less than the next one v3, which is less than the next one v4. That's not necessarily uh, uh, the case. Uh, reflection will work, uh, and we can determine these velocities v1, v2, v3, v4, uh, even if if uh, v1 is the largest velocity and velocity decreases with depth, or if there's a isolated low velocity zone or an isolated high velocity zone, all that uh, uh, will work. Uh, unlike with refraction. So what we're going to try to do here is figure out, all right, what, what do we need to look at in the reflection data in, the, in how the, the, shape of, the hyperbolic shape of the, uh, of the reflections, what do we need to look at to then be able to figure out what those velocities are? Okay? And, and how is the hyperbolic shape of the reflection going to be related to the uh, um, Going to be related to, to these velocities. Okay. Now, what we're doing here is we're assuming that the uh, ref reflectors, the structures, the layers are all perfectly flat. Okay. So we're doing a pure sounding exp uh, experiment above above a stack of perfectly flat layers. You know, like you'd find in the upper uh, levels of the Grand Canyon. Okay. Um, yeah, I know this, they're not perfectly flat, but uh, they're flat enough, uh, especially compared to the geology we have around here. So um, 
Now that that assumption is pretty lame, but uh, um, you know we can we can get what we can out of the velocity, and then we can let migration, which is a process that we'll do, uh, uh, we'll look at later on. Uh, migration takes care of uh, figuring out the the true dip of the reflectors. All right. So now here's the result on the right of our pure sounding experiment, where we've got uh, the time to each reflection. Um, on the and the time is on the vertical axis, increasing down, and then the source receiver offset, the distance between the source between the the say the hammer and the geophone, is this capital X and increasing to the right. All right. So this first reflector is uh, uh, is is actually going to be since it's the top one, it's going to be asymptotic to the velocity v1. All right, and that should actually uh, connect straight back. Uh, to uh, zero distance, zero time, uh, but I didn't draw it that way. So um, the uh, first reflector will have the uh, the steepest uh, asymptotic tail, the steepest hyperbola, because it's asymptotic to a in this case the lowest velocity. Right? Remember, v one is less than v two, and so forth. Uh, velocity is increasing with depth, and then uh, reflector two. Okay. Uh, has a minimum time, an asymptot a uh, t zero, that we're going to call t two. Reflector three has a has a minimum time t three. Reflector four has a minimum time t four. And so the question is, all right, I told you that uh, uh, the first reflection is asymptotic. Its hyperbola is asymptotic in the in the pure sounding experiment. It's asymptotic to v one. Okay. What are the other reflections asymptotic to? Okay. Um, and uh, we have to figure out, you know, what is the average velocity above a particular reflector. So you can see that that the uh, uh, that the reflector at the bottom, the fourth reflect reflector, is uh, below a stack of velocities, you know, starting with v1 and then increasing up to v3 and v4. And um, it turns out that the um, uh, that that reflection is going to be asymptotic to a velocity that is uh, it's a kind of average of uh, of v1, v2, v3, and v4. Okay, and um, so here's some here's some terminology. All right, the reflection that we see, or I'm sorry, the velocity that we see as uh, with the reflection asymptotic to it. Okay. That velocity we call an NMO velocity. That's the observed normal move-out velocity of the reflection. Okay, so that's an observable. We can see that. Okay, we might be able to uh, you know lay a ruler down on our on our section and or you know even our computer screen and measure it. Okay, and and so it's a piece of data. It is what we what we guess it you know what we what we figure it out. Okay, now in terms of analyzing this NMO velocity. All right, we uh, we say that the the NMO velocity we can approximate that pretty closely, uh, you know, for flat reflections. We can approximate it by what's called the root mean squared velocity. So that gives us the this root mean squared is the really the procedure that we use to um, to average the velocities the layer the velocity of of the layers above the reflector. So uh, worth uh, worth remembering uh, this uh, this formula for VRMS, okay, the root mean squared velocity. So VRMS squared is equal to the ratio of two sums, and the sum on the on the numerator is uh, you know adding up uh, all the uh, for all the, the 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 layers, right? We got we got layers uh, one, two, three, and four up here. Okay, so we add add up through all the layers. We add each layer's velocity, and uh, of course uh, squared. Okay, so v sub i squared. That's that would be you know the ith layer's uh, uh, velocity squared times. Okay, and what we have here is uh, delta t sub i. Okay, that's the uh, um, uh, that's a, a time. All right, I'll, I'll define that in a second, and then uh, in the in the denominator we've got another sum. Which is just of the delta t's for each layer. Okay, so you take uh, you can see the the units work out, right? So you take a sum that is uh, 
you know meters per second squared, um, all squared, uh, times uh, seconds, and you divide by a sum of seconds. Okay, and so what you're left with is uh, meters per second all squared, and that's uh, that's an okay unit for uh, VR of s squared. All right, so that is the uh, we can term that as the uh, we, we take that as being equal to the NMO, the normal move out velocity squared, of the nth reflector down. Okay, so it's, we're summing all the layers above the reflector. We're not summing in any layers below the reflector, just uh, the ones above it, right? I mean the the reflection, you know, this reflection here off uh, off uh, reflect reflector number two, right? It goes through uh, layer one and layer two, right? And it doesn't go at all. That reflection doesn't go at all through layer three or layer four, right? So this reflection from layer two doesn't tell us anything at all about uh, uh, layer three or layer four or reflect reflectors uh, uh, three or four. Okay, it has nothing to do with with those. It only tells us we all we know, all we can determine from a reflection is uh, the velocities of the layers above the reflector. Okay. So, um, uh, what are these things? The uh, the v sub i, right? That's the true rock velocity, which we're going to call an interval velocity because you know in, in processing our seismic reflection data, we're going to be looking at these uh, RMS or NMO velocities all the time. And so, um, uh, what we're going to be uh, finding from the uh, the r you know the differences between the RMS velocities is the uh, the real velocity. Uh, in between the reflect the reflectors, right? So um, you know we have a reflection from uh, from reflector one and a reflection from reflector two, and what we can determine, you know, by looking at both of those reflections is, you know, not just the velocity of layer one, okay, but also the velocity of layer two. It's the interval between reflector one and reflector two, okay. So we call it a we call v sub i an interval velocity of the ith layer down, okay? And that interval velocity, you know, under this simple, you know, all these simple assumptions should be the real rock velocity. Whereas, you know, vrms, vnmo, the, and what we'll call the stacking velocity, those are those are an average velocity, right? That we have to compute from the interval velocities, uh, or, or observe in the you know that's just the velocity that the reflection is asymptotic to in a pure sounding experiment. Uh, now what's this uh, delta t sub i? Okay, that's the one way vertical travel time. Okay, in that uh, um, in that layer. Okay, so t sub i is uh, uh, is the one way time just through you know if it's uh, if it's uh, delta t one, then it's the one-way vertical travel time just through layer one. If it's uh, uh, delta t uh, sub four, it's the one-way vertical ta travel time just through layer four. Okay, and each uh, each layer, each interval has a constant interval velocity. Is is another one of our assumptions. All right, so delta t sub i is the uh, is the thickness of the of the of layer i, so that's h sub i uh, divided by the velocity of that layer. So h sub i divided by v sub i. That's delta t sub i. That's all it is. Now remember, okay, um, you know we've got uh, we're observing we're observing you know t one, t two, t three, t four. Can we get t sub i from from those? Uh, uh, can we get can we get the the uh, one way Vertical travel times from the times we observe, and and the answer is yes, absolutely right. Um, but remember, t one, you know, that's the uh, the time for uh, the reflection uh, to go vertically, you know, at zero offset, you know, down through layer one and back up to the surface. So it's it's a two way. The 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 reflection goes two ways. T sub four is uh, the time, you know, from uh, uh, you know, all the way to the surface, all the way down the reflector four, and all the way back up. It's a two-way travel time. Okay, so we take the difference between, you know, if we want delta t uh, two, we take the difference between uh, uh, t two and t one, right? T at uh, for layer i or reflection uh, i minus one, 
So we get that difference, and then we divide it by two, right? So that makes it a one-way instead of a two-way time. That gives us delta t sub i. All right. So you know, if you're given a stack of velocities and uh, uh, and and thicknesses, you can calculate uh, for any one of the you know you can calculate the delta t sub i's. You can calculate um, um, and you can and and then you can calculate. Uh, uh, the uh, the VRMS to uh, each of the reflections uh, in turn. Okay, so uh, you know these are uh, observables, and this is how you know, the simple, very very simple geometry. You know, it's really just geometry here that we use to understand them. Okay, you know now I've said we we can observe the um, the RMS velocities, right? I mean, if uh, if you're given a stack of layers, you know, so you, you know what the geology is, you know what the velocities are, you know what the depths are, right? That's um, you can calculate the uh, RMS velocity, okay? Now, but that's not a very realistic situation because usually you see just the data. You have the times, and you have the asymptotic velocities. You have the RMS velocity of each reflector. Can you get back and um, and and derive uh, you know, extract the the individual interval velocities of each layer, and the answer is yes, you can. Okay, you know, way back um, sixty years ago, um, Hewitt Dix managed to um, uh, to figure out how to sort of uh, you know unaverage or if you like differentiate the VRMS, and he came up with a simple equation which is uh, you know used every day. Uh, every minute, probably in uh, in uh, uh, energy exploration. So um, uh, and it's uh, you know this it's in this the in this double uh, box here, and this this equation is uh, is so useful and so famous that uh, they named it after him. Everybody named it after him. You know, basically consensus. Uh, it's called the Dix equation. Okay. So uh, as long as the maximum offset capital X that you use to measure the curvature of the hyperbolas, you know, and get the asymptotic velocity is small compared to the reflector depths. All right, um, and for the data we record, that's not necessarily going to be true, but it's still uh, a useful approximation. All right, for most, uh, for a lot of surveys, it, it is true, uh, and uh, and the equation is pretty accurate, at least for flat reflectors. Okay, so the interval velocity um, squared. Uh, of the ith layer down is the uh, um, the uh, the RMS uh, velocity of the uh, you know the NMO velocity of the um, of the ith reflector. Okay, so if we're looking for say uh, uh, v two squared, okay, uh, then uh, we calculate it from uh, v two. The RMS velocity to the second reflector, okay, v two RMS, okay, times the uh, the time to the second reflector t um, uh, t sub two, okay, minus all right, the RMS uh, velocity squared and the time to the second, uh, I'm sorry, the the next reflector up, okay, so um, that, that's how we're kind of unaveraging this, right? So uh, we take uh, in, in this case we're looking for v two. We take v one uh, RMS squared times t. I'm sorry, v two RMS squared times t two minus v one RMS squared times t one, and then you also have to divide by t two minus t one. Okay, and so this um, <clears throat> now now notice, you know, um, that gives us v squared, right? And so we'd have to uh, we have to put a square root around the whole thing uh, to get the, the actual velocity. Okay, so uh, uh, the ti's are the two-way vertical times um, of the reflection below the layer, right? So reflector four is at the bottom of layer four. Okay, just a piece of terminology you got to remember. Um, and virms is the asymptotic velocity of the reflection. Uh, but that comes from below the layer. Okay, uh, t um, uh, t i minus one is the time of the reflection above the layer. Right, it's from the 
uh, it's from the next reflector up. And likewise, v at i minus one RMS is the asymptotic velocity of the reflection above the layer. Okay, and what we get is the real interval velocity of the ith layer down. Okay, if we can get a good measure of VRMS on two reflections, all right, then we can get the velocity of the layer in between. All right, and and this this works even if it's a low velocity layer. Okay. Now uh, uh, you know things can happen, of course, when um, uh, you know when we're dealing with real data, right? If you if you build a synthetic model that you know has real uh, real velocities and and uh, and real times, then uh, the Dix equation will always work. You know you'll you'll you know you could you could build that synthetic model and calculate the RMS times and then put them back in here and you'll get to, you'll get a close enough uh, answer and the Dix equation will work. What you'll discover in the reflection lab is that the Dix equation doesn't always work. Okay, so what what can happen? Okay. Um, Sometimes um, you know you've picked the wrong VRMS, right? It's a it's a piece of data. It's an, it's interpretational, um, and and our data are often not you know not easily uh, uh, analyzable for for things like velocity. Uh, usually we can do pretty well with time, but the velocity can be uh, can be pretty uncertain. And you can see that those uncertainties get blown way out of proportion, right? Because we're dealing with the difference between velocities squared, so um, uh, you know funny things can happen. Okay, so um, you know, let's say uh, let's say we've picked uh, on the lower reflection, you know, below the layer, we've picked a velocity that's too high. Okay, and so then what's left after the uh, after we subtract the the VRMS and the and the time to the uh, reflector above, we have too much left, and our velocity will be too high, right? Even after we take the square root. So if you get a, you know, if coming out of the Dix equation, if you get a uh, a velocity that's uh, you know over any reasonable rock velocity, and I suspect uh, you know in the area we'll be working, if it's a p velocity of over three thousand meters a second, you know that'll be. Uh, uh, That'll be uh, uh, about the the greatest interval velocity that that uh, one should have. But you know when we do our um, um, when we do our uh, our, our analysis uh, and and collect our data, um, you know we could have really good data and uh, and we can we can make really good picks of the RMS velocities. Uh, you know using the techniques I'll show you in the reflection lab. And we can still end up with uh, with a huge interval velocity as determined by the Dix equation. Okay, and and how might that happen? Well, remember that uh, if the if a reflection is dipping, if a reflector is dipping, then the velocity will is is biased up. Okay, and so uh, if we're looking at uh, the the interval velocity of a uh, of an interval above a dipping reflector, and you know we might when we analyze we may not, we might not know that it's dipping yet, okay? Then uh, you know this uh, v uh, v i r m s squared will be too large, and um, then the interval velocity we'll get would be too large, and it can be uh, a lot too large. You know we can we can get um, uh, interval velocities of uh, you know that are obviously totally ridiculous. Uh, you know they'd be the velocity is of of the uh, uh, of the mantle or or out inner core, right? P velocities of 10,000, 20,000 uh, meters per second are obviously unphysical in in the area that we're working, um, but uh, uh, they do happen. And it you know takes something as simple as dip, you know, which of course is going to be everywhere in our our field area, uh, to uh, you know confuse the Dix uh, velocity calculation. Okay, uh, so that uh, that can happen also. Uh, we might pit, we might decide uh, you know velocity is is higher and then down below just a little bit lower you know we see another reflection and the velocities uh, you know we we decide to pick an RMS velocity that's a lot lower and what can what can happen there is that the time difference uh, is is not enough and um, and the the uh, you know v two is uh, um, 
the uh, uh, this velocity here, v i r m s, is too much lower. Okay, and so when you make the subtraction, you get a negative result, right? Now on the on the denominator, that's that never goes negative, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that's always uh, you know the larger time minus the smaller time, right? You keep going down, you keep increasing in time, so there's never a problem on the denominator. On the numerator, though. Uh, it's a huge problem, and that can go negative. And so then, what you want to take the square root of goes negative. And of course, you can't take the square root of a negative number. So um, uh, you know the the calculation will just throw back an error or maybe zero to indicate that it's an error. Right? A zero velocity is not not very realistic if you're if you're examining uh, p velocity. Okay. So um, uh, that's an indication that uh, you know maybe the uh, you're you're you know overpicking or overinterpreting, and velocity is falling too fast with time. Um, you know the 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 Dick's equation will give you that low velocity zone. It'll give you the velocity in that low velocity zone. You know when velocity decreases with depth, but uh, it's it's a tricky thing to interpret uh, correctly because uh, uh, you know with with our actual data analysis we might well find that we we get a zero under the or a negative number under the radical, and uh, and so we have to stop. Okay. Now you know all these are, are very reasonable things to happen, especially the the velocity the, the interval velocity is too high. So we just have to uh, we may have to accept a, 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 an incorrect interval velocity. Okay, an unreasonable interval velocity because it could be correct. Okay, it's not the real velocity. It's just there's some other effect like dip that uh, is interfering. Okay. So uh, once we have the stack of, of interval velocities, right? We want to know um, the thickness of the ith layer down, and we can just use this little equation here. You know, uh, the thickness h at, at, of of layer i is uh, the interval velocity of layer i divided by two. Okay. Um, times uh, the difference in the two-way travel times, right? Uh, ti minus t of i minus one. Okay, that's that's the difference between the the zero offset reflection times. Okay, so we can get velocity, we can get depth, and uh, that's what we wanted to get from you know this analysis of these uh, hyperbolic reflections. Okay, so those are some simple ways of um, of finding the uh, <clears throat> some simple ways of finding the uh, uh, the quantities we want to know, you know, depth and uh, and velocities. Okay, we need the velocities, of course, to uh, to get the depths. So, what we um, uh, you know what we're trying to do here is is figure out. Um, all right. If we can just make those, uh, you know, get those times and recognize the slopes from the from the times, right, and and uh, and get the uh, asymptotic velocities, right. So uh, the accuracy uh, uh, of what we're doing is going to be influenced a lot by by you know how how well can we make these time picks, you know, t one, t two, t three, t four. How well can we do that? Okay. And the trouble is. Um, you know, seismic data are wave data. Okay, you tend, you know, even the best the best data set, you know, even after the best processing, the best field field uh, uh, procedures, uh, the uh, most favorable uh, conditions, uh, the best processing, we still end up with this wavelet. Okay, and this wavelet is um, is so typical in in our seismic uh, reflection results that it has a special name. And in fact, there's a special equation that uh, uh, that determines it. It's just uh, you know kind of a typical wavelet that we see, and so uh, it's called the Ricker wavelet. And we can you know look at the properties of this wavelet, and that tells us a lot about you know what our accuracy is going to be. Okay. Now the 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 wavelet has a central peak. Okay, and um, usually you you think of the uh, uh, you know, for certain kinds of surveys, you you will be trying to pick the uh, the time of the central peak. Now, for our sledgehammer and the uh, 
uh, and dynamite surveys, okay, or um, chirp survey, no, not chirp, but for uh, you know impulsive source surveys, we're trying to pick pick the very first time when the the seismic wave amplitude, you know, in this seismogram, leaves the zero line, which is this dashed line here, okay. So our our time pick is going to be maybe uh, you know right there uh, for our hammer data, okay. Um, whereas uh, you know most process data sets, uh, you know, coming from uh, vibrator sources, uh, the chirp source, okay, uh, all those process data sets, uh, which you know we're going to pick the the time of the reflection right in the middle of that uh, of that main hump there, all right, and and you know around that that main part are uh, two negative side lobes, okay, and if you take the the distance, which is you know the, the time axis goes to the right here, okay. So this is the seismogram we're looking at, uh, you know, as if it was an earthquake seismogram, and and you know the time between the uh, uh, the first uh, minimum and the second side lobe minimum, uh, that's called the the breadth of the wavelet, okay, um, and so let's call it b, and it's going to be some number of seconds or milliseconds, okay, um, and and as you might imagine, the uh, the broader the wavelet is, the more trouble we're going to have getting an exact, um, you know, getting a, a, a an accurate uh, pick of what time that central peak is at. Okay, that's and that's really the problem. Um, you know, we could we could we could look at this uh, wavelet breadth and say, uh, well, you know, I can I can see it pretty well right there, and that's you know I can get it down to a a tenth of the uh, wavelet breadth. Well, maybe you can, but that's you know perfectly clean uh, data. You know this is uh, theoretical here. And once you're you know when you're looking at real field data, okay, you can see the wavelet all right, but uh, there's also going to be noise, okay, and that's going to interfere in your ability to uh, to pick it to, you know much more accurately than the than the wavelet breadth, okay. Now the the Richter wavelet has a pretty simple spectrum, okay. So you know, there's energy at a at a bunch of different uh, frequencies. You know, over over a range. I mean, there's energy in that Richter wavelet, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. You know, at very low frequencies and also at very high frequencies. Um, but uh, you know, basically, um, uh, at uh, and there's going to be a fairly narrow range of, of frequencies, and that's that's what we're we're fighting all the time in seismic reflection. Um, we have a, a we end up with a narrow range of frequencies. You know that's a, a problem with uh, Q and scattering, which cuts off the high frequencies. You know with distance, uh, and then uh, the ability of our of our sources to uh, uh, to put in uh, low frequency energy, and and often also the ability of our geophones to record low frequency energy. Okay, so we end up with this what I call band limited uh, Richter wavelet. Okay. So you know a lot of the energy uh, at um, at the uh, uh, in, in the Richter wavelet, you know, is at this peak, right? And let's call that a a peak frequency, okay? And um, um, and and that peak frequency, okay, is um, is a little bit less than the uh, for the Richter wavelet. Uh, then one over b, right? So if b if b is in seconds, then one over b is in hertz, you know, per second, right? So um, uh, and that's called the predominant frequency of the uh, um, or the dominant frequency of the uh, uh, of the wavelet, and that's on the high side just a little bit, okay? Uh, so um, the uh, the peak frequency is a little bit lower. It's at seventy-eight percent of the uh, of the dominant frequency, all right. And then uh, you know halfway down, right, from one to half of the response, uh, call it uh, six decibels down, okay, is um, at uh, thirty-seven and a half percent and one hundred twenty-eight percent, call it, okay. So so really, uh, you know, most of the energy is contained. Uh, you know, within this fairly narrow range, all right, uh, and then uh, uh, you know, 
almost every absolutely everything really is uh, between the 20 dB down. You know, so you know more than 10 percent of the of the of the of the predominant frequency, right? Uh, 15 percent to 172 percent of the dominant frequency. It's not even you know we really have nothing at twice the dominant frequency. And we have uh, similarly nothing at ten percent of the dominant frequency. Okay, narrow band. All right. So what this says is that uh, you know with this uh, this b is never uh, is never zero. Right. The wave nature of the data just doesn't allow that. Right. If it was if if there was no breadth of the wavelet, it would have no energy, and we would never record it. We'd never see it. All right. So there's always a non-zero b. And uh, you know it's uh, it's going to tell us uh, it's going to tell us a lot about the resolution of our data. You know how accurately can we see depths and times? Okay, and and it, it even has a, a role you know through the horizontal resolution in how accurately uh, we can locate something. You know we see a feature, a fault, the top of a, of an aniform in our um, in our data. And uh, we we might want to know exactly where that is because we want to drill into it. And, and how well do we know where that is? Well, it depends again on our wavelet breadth. The broader our wavelets, the uh, in other in other words, the lower frequency our our data, um, then the harder it is going to be for us to uh, uh, to see the uh, to to get those accurate locations, those accurate depths, and accurate velocities too. Okay, because the time affects all those things. So first, let's talk about simple vertical resolution. All right, and there's this uh, this concept that um, <clears throat> you know we have uh, we have two different reflections. Okay, and they're far enough apart. You know, when you when you put in you know the 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 boundary between uh, uh, the layers is is right on that spike there. You know, and and right, um, you know, you go up to an outcrop and you look at uh, the width of a transition between two uh, two formations. It can be, you know, a millimeter or less. Uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, a grain size is uh, entirely possible. You know, so in the, in the scale of our seismic data, it's basically a spike. Okay, around each spike is the Richter wavelet. Okay, and. Um, <clears throat> So if the if the spikes are far apart enough, you know, if the if the layer that we're trying to see, you know, we're trying to see a distinct reflection from the top of it and the bottom of it, right? Time is increasing to the right here, okay. And uh, if if the if the if the layer is thick enough, then we can see that distinct Richter wavelet on uh, on each one. You know, the, they're resolved, okay. But you bring it closer, okay. You bring it uh, to uh, b over two the the uh, the wavelet breadth uh, half of the wavelet breadth apart, and you can still see the two peaks, okay, um, and there is a trough in between them, but they're not you know they're not totally they're not totally separate peaks. There's uh, sort of two sub peaks with a trough, and if the data are noisy enough that you lose that trough, well, you might not see it, okay. Then you bring it down to um, <clears throat> even narrower, you know, make the the layer even thinner. And uh, you know the reflection from the top and the reflection from the bottom, you can only distinguish them if you have really really good data and you can see a flat spot on the top of the uh, uh, on the top of the wave. Okay. Now our data are not going to be that good. Okay. Just there's just no way. Um, but there are data sets where where you can distinguish the flat spots. So so that flat spot is like the last vestige, the last reason to believe. That these are two different uh, two different reflections here, you know, added into one, and you put them together, and notice uh, you're adding those Richter wavelets together, and um, and so for a thin layer, a layer that's too thin, you'll get a stronger reflection. You know, the peak is higher, but you can't tell it's two it's two reflections added together. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the problem. All right, so here's a here's a geological situation. You know, we have a we have a reflector above, and then there's a layer and a reflector below, and then coming into that is a uh, a dipping reflection which terminates against the uh, the flat one on the right hand side. Okay, so um, 
you know, how thin can this can this uh, uh, interval get in here? How thin can it get before you know seismically we just cannot resolve it? Okay, where does it stop seismically? All right, and that's uh, was illustrated by Calwade and Wood many years ago. Okay, so here's the exact spike. You know that that's the upper reflection and the Richter wa wa wavelet that's around it. And then here's the, the lower uh, flat reflection and then the, the dipping one that's coming into it and terminating. Okay. And you can see that when the uh, reflections are, are close enough together, okay, uh, you know, there's the flat spot. All right. And say here, you can't really distinguish those as separate reflections. Okay. And certainly to the right, you know, okay, the reflection is getting stronger, but you can't, you can't distinguish it. Okay. You know, time here is is going down, unlike uh, you know, up here uh, time was uh, time was going to the right. Okay, so um, uh, you know, out to a uh, uh, this flat spot. Okay, that's like the minimum thickness we need to see that layer. As a separate layer to see that second reflection, okay. When the layer is 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 uh, is thinner than than T sub R, than the temporal temporal resolution, okay, then we can't detect it as a, as an individual layer. It looks just like, even though it's got two reflectors uh, around it, you know, one on top and one on the bottom, we only see one reflector, okay. And this uh, uh, here are some criteria for uh, for vertical resolution. All right, so um, uh, and and we think of uh, uh, you know we think of the resolution in terms of depth, right, and thickness. So that's in meters. So so we're going to express our, our vertical resolution criterion um, in terms of um, uh, not in terms of time, but in terms of uh, of depth difference. Okay, and uh, and in terms of uh, instead of in terms of frequency. We express it in terms of wavelength, right? Because wavelength is in terms of length or depth, and um, um, you know, whereas frequency is in terms of time. All right. So the the uh, Wydeus and, and Richter criteria say that uh, when you have a thickness that is less than um, the wavelength lambda, that's a Greek letter lambda there. A thickness that's less than lambda over four. Okay, that uh, uh, you cannot, uh, you you're not going to be able to see it. Okay, it's too thin. It'll look like one reflection and not two. All right, and uh, you know, Calwade and Wood they made an argue an argument uh, for uh, uh, you know doing a little bit better. And Richter said, uh, uh, you know, when you use the peak frequency, you can you can divide you know the wavelength by five instead of uh, instead of by four. Um, but really, uh, um, you know, in our in our data, we're going to be very very lucky uh, if we can distinguish anything, you know, any uh, any differences in depth, any any individual reflections that are, uh, uh, you know, thickness that that have thicknesses or depth differences of uh, uh, really less than the wavelength itself, you know. Will be it, we have to have really good data to be able to divide that wavelength by four to get our resolution, but that, that is the you know commonly used with Des and Richter criteria. So the um, uh, now now the wavelength if if you remember back to uh, uh, the first uh, lecture, v equals f lambda. Okay, that's our watchword that I had asked you to uh, to memorize. Right, uh, v is the velocity, f is the frequency, and lambda is that Greek letter. That's the wavelength. Okay, so you solve it for wavelength. You know, wavelength is equal to velocity over frequency. So uh, you know, if you have a guess at the velocity, you know, let's say you think the velocity at the bottom of the alluvium is uh, two thousand meters per second, and uh, you're trying to image it with um, uh, at a frequency of one hundred hertz. Okay, with waves that are that have a, a dominant frequency of hundred hertz, then um, uh, you know, you take uh, two thousand divide by hundred. That's twenty meters. That means your wavelength is twenty meters, and you you cannot okay you cannot see any layers that are thicker that are thinner 
than uh, 5 meters, right? That would be lambda over 4, 20 meters divided by 4. Okay, uh, and you know, with with most data sets that that we can record, you know, it has to be uh, it really has to be a 20 meter thick um, layer before we can see it in reflection. Okay, and that we can reliably do. Uh, so uh, you know, you you if uh, if your project depends on on finding depth differences that are only one meter, uh, or your client says that uh, you know. Um, uh, at the bottom of the basin, he wants you to uh, to get a uh, uh, to derive a, a depth to an accuracy of uh, uh, of of one meter. Okay, I mean right away you can tell him that that's impossible, and he's welcome to try you know to hire another consultant, but uh, uh, you don't know any way to do it, and uh, and wish him luck. Okay, I mean if you if you try to work for a client like that, uh, you'll end up uh, in, in probably in a bad way, you know. Um, you got to choose your clients sometimes. Now this uh, this curve here, uh, and you can see that there's some shading on the one I want to look at. Okay, uh, the thickness curve. So um, uh, on the on the horizontal axis is the the actual. Um, uh, milliseconds of thickness. Okay, so that's a time thickness. Okay, like we, you know, we're looking at a reflection section. It's a time thickness um, for uh, that 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 is truly there. You know, there's a layer that truly has that thickness. Okay, you know, uh, two-way time of uh, uh, ten milliseconds, twenty, thirty, etc. Okay, and we're using a twenty-five hertz Richter wavelet here to illustrate. Okay, what happens? When um, you know what's the what's the what's the thickness that we can see in the waves? Okay, you know, given this this vertical resolution criterion, you know, what do we what do we see? And this is uh, again from Cal Wade and Wood, and um, so uh, you know when the thickness is large, uh, you know, much larger than the uh, um, uh, much larger than the um, when the thickness is much larger than the uh, um, than the than the wavelet breadth, okay, we get an exact answer, you know. So at fifty meters, uh, um, I mean, sorry, at fifty uh, milliseconds uh, thickness, you know, we get uh, uh, we we can measure, we can see and measure a fifty millisecond uh, uh, that fifty millisecond thickness, okay, and then it comes down to 20, 20 milliseconds, right, and you can see the apparent thickness is, has gone just slightly more. Than the true thickness. That's not going to bother us too much, but what happens after that? Okay, the th the thickness goes down, and suddenly the apparent thickness, you know, bang hits zero, just drops to nothing, which means we can't see that there's any thickness. You know that the you know at ten milliseconds a true thickness, you know we see zero apparent thickness, which means we don't see it. Right? It's uh, it's not there. Uh, it's 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 the, well it's there but it's not in the data okay uh, for this 25 hertz uh, record wavelet so uh, 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 that's really what happens you know when the uh, uh, when the thickness um, uh, when the thickness gets to be uh, too little then we don't see it as a separate layer we only see one reflection okay vertical resolution. And and this is our motivation, you know. We we want we want high resolution, right? We want to be able to tell depth differences and 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 see thin layers. So we're always trying to get that higher frequency uh, data that has the the small breadths, the small b's in the Richter wavelet uh, breadth. You know, we want those sharp, uh, you know, definitive Richter wavelets. Okay, trying very hard to get that high frequency data. Okay, and you'll see just how hard it is to get high frequency data in um, <clears throat> uh, when we talk about uh, um, uh, when we when we're trying to do it in the field. Okay. All right. Now um, there's an additional kind of resolution, right? We've just we've just talked about vertical resolution, and that sets the the stage. Now we can talk about horizontal resolution. Okay. So we're trying we're trying to to distinguish 
you know, here we have our, our source and, and our receivers there too. And, and we want to, you know, we're looking at a reflection from this depth point to D, if you can see it there. And we, we're trying to distinguish it from another point out here. Okay, call it point F. All right. So point F is, is some point, you know, some distance laterally away from, uh, um, some distance laterally away from, uh, from point D. Okay. Now to see it, okay, Notice, you know, the path, the reflection path, you know, to and from the source to point D is straight up and down, right? And that's got to have that's going to have some number of waves in it, right? And uh, to point F, you know, it's a little bit tilted over, right? And so it, it's a little bit further, right? A little bit further to F to see, uh, you know, to see point F from the same observation point, all right? Now, at, you know, so being a little bit further, it takes a little bit more time. Right, so D, so D took the time uh, to get down to that trough, right? And F is taking an extra uh, half cycle, right? To you know, to get to and from point F. Okay, so we make this little triangle here. The source is at the top. Here's the uh, the depth to, to point D. Okay, and then the 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 sideways depth to point F, right? Is uh, well, you know, and and. Um, how far away does it have to be? Okay, you know, to see it as a different reflection, it's got to be at, you know, distance d plus at least lambda over four, right? The, uh, you know, lambda is the wavelength of the wave divided by four. Remember, lambda is equal to um, uh, to v over f. Okay, so the uh, the higher the frequency, the smaller the lambda, right? And uh, and the smaller the lambda, the less that these two legs are different, and the uh, uh, and the smaller the base of this triangle will be. Now the base of this triangle has a special name. It's called the Fresnel radius, r sub f. Okay, uh, and the um, the Fresnel radius tells you the diff the distance, you know, horizontal distance uh, within which you cannot distinguish two different points, right? Because their their distance, you know, from the from the surf the surface source, their distance from the surface source is uh, 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 differs by you know less than a quarter wavelength, right? And so there's just no hope, okay? And you know we might we might decide that we have to use like four times the Fresnel radius, right? Because you know we just can't. Uh, um, we just can't can't get the uh, um, uh, we we just can't get the uh, um, uh, the same data quality that uh, you know that's uh, that's here on 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 this data set uh, and and this is you know this is really a pretty hard theoretical limit I mean there's really no way um, you know if you're uh, um, if you're dealing with band limited uh, seismic data, okay, there's just no way to get to less than lambda over four, okay. Uh, but you know, with our lousy data sets, we might be looking at four times lambda over four. We might be looking at the wavelength itself, so four times the Fresnel radius, approximately. Okay, so you know, working out what this triangle is, right? Uh, the Fresnel radius is the velocity, and I would use the uh, you know the stacking velocity, the NMO velocity, the the uh, which should be the same as the uh, RMS velocity. You know down to the ref down to the reflector D. Okay, and so uh, velocity divided by two times the square root of the ratio of the two-way uh, travel time to reflector D divided by the frequency, and that's the would be the dominant frequency of that uh, Ricker wavelet. Okay, so R sub F is the radius of Fresnel zone. That's our you know, and if, if two points are separated by less than that, we cannot distinguish them. You know, if we 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 have a drill target, and we calculate the Fresnel radius from our frequency and from our um, our uh, average velocity to the uh, drill target, um, and it's uh, two-way travel time, then um, uh, and and we do that, and uh, uh, and we calculate the Fresnel radius. Okay. What that means is that we don't know 
where that target is horizontally, okay, to within that radius. All right. So let's say uh, it, it, you know for for right. Notice the two-way travel time here, right? So for reflectors that are pretty deep, you know this two-way time is going to be pretty big, okay. And so um, and we're going to also have trouble, you know, from deeper reflections, we have trouble getting high frequencies. So you know we're going to be stuck with kind of a low frequency divided out of a large time. So we're going to get a large uh, square root there. And uh, you know, high velocities are also uh, uh, worse. So you know, the deeper it is, the higher the velocity is generally. And we're going to have this big Fresnel radius. Maybe it's going to be a hundred meters. Okay, that means that that we can't target the drill to within a hundred meters of where that uh, where that is. Um, now, I, I um, um, you know, there there are some techniques of getting beyond this, but in general. You know, you have to you have to go to great lengths to uh, uh, and and collect a whole lot of data uh, and uh, and maybe uh, some some higher frequency data to uh, have a hope of of being able to target something you know with within the Fresnel radius. All right. So so what that means is uh, you know you whenever you're giving somebody a drill location, you've got to you've got to make this calculation for yourself and say well okay. Uh, you know how well do I know this location that I'm giving them? Okay, and if I got low frequency and and it's deep and, and large two-way time and high velocity, well, you know the, the Fresnel radius can be hundreds of meters, and so you know you you might not know uh, where to put the drill within hundreds of meters, and that uh, you know that's just a fact of life. Um, you can't uh, you can't get around that, um, and and so that's uh, that's why it's in, in important to uh, you know for drillers these days to be able to recognize when they're going into fault zones or uh, uh, or overpressured zones. Um, you know they can even uh, run logs while they're drilling that, that can tell you the dip of the strata um, and other you know you can keep looking at the rock chips that are coming out of the uh, out of the hole as it's being drilled. You know all those things are going to help you steer. The uh, the drill more uh, more accurately than uh, um, and and get within that Fresnel radius, but you can't do it from the seismic data alone. Um, okay, so uh, that's a, a view of um, you know how we get uh, uh, velocities above uh, you know reflections that are in a whole stack of reflections, um, and uh, and then having velocities, how we get depth. And then I needed to talk about uh, the wave nature of uh, um, of, uh, of our seismic data, and and essentially uh, I didn't say this before, but it's really because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, which is exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, we don't have infinite resolution. Uh, we can't tell what time a reflector comes in. You know, within a certain slop, within a certain breadth, a wavelet breadth. So. You know, high frequency data are better, and uh, and they'll give us more accurate depths and more accurate uh, uh, horizontal resolution. Um, but uh, often we're stuck with low frequency data, and so we always have to calculate our vertical resolution, calculate our horizontal resolution. You know, best guess we can, and uh, be honest with our clients and tell them, uh, you know, the the uh, what we don't know. Okay. And and with many things in science and engineering, it's it's this this resolution information. You know how how much is it that we don't know? You know what's our what's the limit of our of our uh, of our uncertainty? Right, that is way more value valuable than the um, the knowledge of the quantity itself. Okay, you know knowing knowing the the slop in your drill location. You know the uh, uncertainty in, in where you have to punch down that drill. Um, that's way more important uh, to the uh, uh, the permitting process sometimes than exactly where you you put the drill pad. Okay, uh, so these are these are uh, very fundamental considerations, and uh, um, you know in in, in any uh, report uh, or uh, in any uh, analysis of seismic data that. That uh, that you give me, one of the first things I'm going to ask you to show me is what are the vertical and horizontal resolutions. 
And uh, so that's the end of reflection lecture number two. And uh, we'll go on uh, with uh, later with uh, reflection processing um, and uh, reflection interpretation.